that, I'd like to introduce uh, Trey and Adrian, who will be taking us through today's presentation. Guys, take it away. Uh, thanks, Brad. Uh, I guess we'll give our, our backgrounds and our names first. I'll start first. My name is Trey Tennell. I am a Watson and artificial intelligence uh, subject matter expert for IBM. I spent the last year as the North American lead for the public sector for Watson AI. And I also teach uh, a cloud and AI course at Auburn University. How about you, Adrian? Yeah, uh, my name is Adrian Kasberg. I am a technical specialist uh, in the Watson data and AI um, uh, sector at IBM. Uh, I've been working with the AI services, specifically assistant and discovery um, for the last year and a half or so. So I'm excited to be here. Okay, so I guess I'll start. Let me share my screen. Is everybody able to see that? Hey, Brad, can you I'm see my screen? Yet, Trey. No, I'm not. Okay. Trey, I'm not seeing anything. Let me try again. I'll just share the whole screen. Oh, okay, I missed the share button. I wonder, okay. There we all go. All right, you should be able to see it now. Yep. You're all set. All right, thank you. That Zoom thing wants to keep me from starting my show, but. All right. Uh, so what I thought we would do is we would actually start with some background about AI. And, and if you look at it, Watson was really the birth of widespread commercial AI. And, and you know, everywhere you look, AI is suddenly taking over the world. You know, you see it in the news, you see it in the newspapers, you hear about countries, you know, battling each other for supremacy in AI. I think a lot of people don't understand what that means. And so uh, PricewaterCooperhouse actually predicts that AI will drive global GDP gains of $15.7 trillion by 2030. This is more than the GDP of China, so this is really huge. And so it's really coming like a tsunami. And, and it has come so soon that most people don't realize what is AI, why does it suddenly have so much attention, and where is it going? And so most people don't realize how quickly it's coming. You know, if you look back at AI, AI has been around since the, the invention of computers, you know, in the, in the 40s. In 1943, to be specific, when we started building the first general purpose computer, people started thinking of AI, and it never really went anywhere. You know, in 1997, we had a big win where IBM beat the world chess champion, but it, and nobody ever thought that would be possible. But, you know, kind of after that, it, it kind of fizzled out, right? You know, if you look at Deep Blue winning the world chess championship back then, a lot of it was you know, we train Watson, uh, sorry, Deep Blue to understand a lot of chess moves. And then using brute force, it could actually search through these moves to kind of figure out where to move next. So this was a big deal, but a lot of it was brute force and data representation. And so if you look at the current AI renaissance, there's actually two things arguably that have, have drove this uh, renaissance. One of those is Watson, which I'll get to in a minute. And the other is something called artificial neural networks. And, and so, like I said, in the beginning, you know, even as early as the 40s, people started thinking about how do we create artificial brains? We figured out how to, to create these general purpose computers. What if we could train them, you know, to have a brain like a human? Then we can do anything. Also, at the same time, some researchers, some neuroscientists were actually looking at the brain and they discovered that the brain actually learns, communicates, et cetera, through these neurons. And so neurons in your brain connect together. They pass information to each other via elect electrical impulses. And that's how you learn. You know, when we see, uh, you know, like with our eyes, it's these um, images that go into our brain and these neurons pass information to each other, maybe to identify dog, cats, and things like that. So the thing about these artificial neural networks is that, you know, when they started building these things, you know, they said, we'll model them like the brain and we'll make it just like a human. And then anything is possible. But in 1970, 
uh, some researchers at MIT said, this is impossible. You'll never be able to do it. Uh, and so everybody kind of gave up on that. And, and so AI actually languished for years. In fact, in the 90s, I was actually a PhD student at Vanderbilt University. Almost all my friends were interested in artificial intelligence, but I really thought it had nowhere to go. Since artificial uh, brains weren't working, people were just trying to figure out ways to represent data. So people spent decades of their careers, you know, trying to figure out how do I make a computer recognize a cat, a dog, a brain tumor, things like that. So, so they spent decades of their lives doing that. And the thing they were actually missing was something that could actually sort of self-modify itself and match patterns. So this was the missing link. And it wasn't until 2011 uh, where some guys in Toronto actually went to, to compete in a speech or voice recognition contest. And so what they did is they, they had been playing with artificial neural networks for a couple of decades. They said, we'll create one of these, we'll enter it in this contest and we'll see what happens. And they didn't just win, they just blew the competition away. And so at this point in 2011, three companies stood up and said, what's going on? So IBM, Google, and Microsoft met with these researchers and said, how did you do this? Show us you know, your techniques. And so suddenly in 2011, late 2011, that's when Siri came out. So if you notice, if you had any experience with like voice recognition software prior to, to 2011, it was very bad, you know? So again, people were just trying to figure out ways to represent data, represent words like cat, dog, uh, girl, boy. And so they languished and it wasn't very good. And once they started figuring out how to use these artificial neural networks, then they figured out, you know, now I can make it really good. And that's why you had all these voice capabilities. And so again, only three companies paid attention in 2012, these guys said, well, there's a big worldwide image competition. And so it was image recognition. It was, you know, seeing an image and recognizing, again, cats, dogs, picnic benches, you know, forks, spoons, couches, TVs. And so they entered this contest. And again, they didn't just win. They blew everybody else away. And so suddenly the whole world stood up and took notice. And then what they realized is that this missing link we had in AI, this universal pattern matcher, they had finally found it. And so it's because of this ability to, you know, take some data. Once you get enough data, you can actually match that, that we have the ability to have things like self-driving cars, voice recognition with Siri, Alexa, et cetera, robotics that truly work, you know, robots that can actually you know, walk and run an obstacle course, you know, drones that can fly themselves. And, and in this deep rec image recognition where, you know, if you have a, a car or a drone or something else where it can see things in front of it, it can recognize stop signs. It can recognize people, places, things. And, and so this, this is really, when you hear about AI in the news, this is what's transformed that. And the other thing that happened in 2011, uh, late January, early February 2011, was Watson won on Jeopardy. And so if you go and you Google newspaper articles uh, from 2011, this time frame, you'll see people saying, this is the biggest innovation in computers in decades. Uh, I've seen other articles where people say, this is the biggest innovation in computers in a century. So what was different, and this was a big open problem in computer science, was that suddenly a computer could understand a question to the extent of a human and answer like a human. So this was a big deal that transformed everything. And so in 2014, IBM declared itself an AI company. And, and again, in 2014, people still weren't really aware what was happening in AI. And so if you look from 2011 to now, 2020, it's only 11 years. So we're really kind of still in the stone age and everything is evolving. And so IBM saw the future and said, we're going to be an AI company now. We see this tsunami coming. And so what IBM actually realized, if you really want to understand IBM's point of view, they realized that Watson, you know, it's language understanding combined with these artificial neural networks, these artificial brains, 
could change the entire world. So if you have, you know, Watson that can read documents, medical documents, uh, financial documents, you name it, and actually understand semantically what is being said and then bring that back, that'll change everything. And if you can actually do it via any channel, via voice, text, SMS message, chatbot, you name it, suddenly you have this very powerful influx of AI across the entire world. And, and so if you look at IBM, IBM has one of the most advanced AI platforms in the, in the AI industry. And so what we can actually do is this full spectrum of conversational AI capabilities. You know, we can have virtual agents, we can have voice agents, we can have AI search where you can use natural language. And then we also have advanced capabilities like agent assist. So if you're an agent in a call center, Watson can actually assist you there. And I'll go into more on that in a minute. It can determine best, best next action. It can actually, you know, uh, ingest data from previous calls or maybe even your back end systems to understand, you know, based on what this person is saying in the, in the context and the scenario, this is the best, next best action and give that recommendation to the agent so they can take that action. And the other nice thing is that Watson is specifically built for the enterprise to be customer or external facing. The other nice thing, uh, if you look to the far right in the middle is that we have built our platform to be open. So you can actually use the IBM cloud or you can actually put it in any other cloud platform. So we can also invoke uh, auto, a robotic process automation. You know, we can call back in systems. We can, uh, again, invoke processes. We can actually pass to live agents, whether it's chat or voice. So we built this mature, very mature full spectrum of AI capabilities. And, and so what it's allowed us to do in this short period of time, it's allowed IBM to deliver AI resolutions and outcomes across all interaction points. So it's not just a simple, you know, FAQ chatbot that can answer some simple questions. You know, we have the ability to come across any channel, whether it's email, fax, voice, a chatbot, et cetera, understand what people are saying and then respond appropriately. What you also see in this is we have something called Watson Discovery that I'll go into later. And, and so when we went on what, I'm sorry, when Watson went on this on Jeopardy, part of that secret sauce, uh, the, more, the part that could actually go back in the back end and find answers, we have actually put that into our product called Watson Discovery so that we can actually crawl websites, you know, and just, you know, box folders or other documents, PDFs, uh, Word documents, et cetera, have Watson uh, sort of scan that, annotate it, and understand it semantically so you can do natural language searches on that. And then not only can you do natural language searches on that, you can provide that in any context. So you can provide it in a chat bot for someone maybe on your website that is asking questions, maybe even deep questions that you would never even anticipate that they would ask, along with maybe assisting people, you know, whether it's a call agent, you know, uh, it could be someone in a call center that is answering questions and needs Watson to go find that information without them having to do a lot of digging. Or it could be, you know, you, you may need some information for your subject matter experts. Uh, so we see a lot of customers. We, we had one automotive uh, customer that had that's uploaded their entire um, automobile, you know, all, the, all their parts and everything into discovery so that their experts could actually ask it information. And again, we do any type of backend integration as needed. And, and so what you really see is that we can augment end users, whether it's people on the phone, uh, experts, et cetera, customers. We can actually augment end users with cognitive technology. And actually what you see here is that it actually loops and it's continuously learning. You know, so what happens is that you, know, you may continue to feed it new documents. Uh, you may have expert who, experts who are refining the information in here. And then Watson itself, for example, with this discovery, I told you that was part of our secret sauce for uh, winning on Jeopardy. It actually learns itself. You know, the more questions people ask it and it and it looks at the results that they select, 
it actually learns semantically what they're asking and then gets smarter and smarter over time without you having to do anything. So let me stop and see if there's any questions. Okay. I'm not seeing any, Trey. Okay. You know, so what this lets us do, you know, with IBM and our focus on, you know, business world, the enterprise, it actually lets us create a seamless experience across the entire enterprise. You know, so we have this comp comprehensive platform. You can actually train it to understand your business language. So it could be legal, medical, uh, public sector, you name it, HR. We can actually train it to understand your language and then actually have it be able to respond in your language. We also have pre-built cartridges for industries such as HR, IT help desk, you know, payers, providers. And again, we can actually be deployed to any platform. And so what you have with this industry solution is the ability to drastically reduce the time to value. So suddenly, you know, even in 2014, when IBM declared themselves an AI company, all of these kind of things seemed impossible. Suddenly, six years later, you have this integrated platform where you can do these powerful things. And we actually uh, have provide connectors to backend systems like Salesforce, Workday, ServiceNow. Uh, again, we can also go to any other any other API based backend system, whether it's databases, content management systems, et cetera. And you know, we have a lot of customers that come to us. Um, just I've, I've worked with three just this week alone that. You know, maybe they're working in an IT help desk, and so they have backend integration with ServiceNow. And so Ser ServiceNow actually has a plugin uh, that, you know, you can put into their system, and then it replaces their chatbot with Watson Assistant. So you can have a very sophisticated, sophisticated virtual agent that can answer your questions. And so if you look at this, uh, so, uh, you know, I've been involved with AI for, for quite a while. And what you see is that, again, because we're kind of in the Stone Age and people are only starting to understand this, there's been this slow progression of conversational AI. And so people start with a chat bot, and it may just answer simple questions. So I, I see this over and over. People just maybe have their, you know, top 10 questions, and they have Watson or some other chat bot answer those questions. Uh, then it can turn into simple conversations you know, simple dialogues. And, and I'll show you an example uh, later where it, it can be a very complex conversation where it can actually, you know, ask your name and maybe pay your bills and things like that. And so these simple conversations, and this is probably where people are right now, they're, they're trying to get to this level too. These simple, simple conversations, they start turning into complex conversations, you know, where maybe Watson can integrate with your backend system and a caller can call in and say, you know, for example, if I think I have COVID-19, I may want to call my insurance company and see if, it's, if it covers me going to my nearest urgent care. And so what you'll see, and we actually have customers doing this, is that Watson will integrate with the back end, can pull this information out, and it could actually talk to a person on the phone and tell that. So Watson could actually be an interface or could be providing this information to a, an agent in a call center. And what you're eventually going to see is these very intelligent virtual advisors. At some point, all of us are going to have our own kind of virtual assistant that will go out, it'll understand us, it'll go out and handle tasks for us, and they'll inter interact with other uh, intelligent agents. And so, what it'll be able to do is it'll be understand, it'll be able to understand, you know, again, us completely. It'll understand. It, um, you know, how to adapt, how to, to how to find the right answers based on our context, on our needs. And so this is where things are going. And, and so what we really have based kind of on this maturity top chart is five flavors of Watson AI assistance. So we have, you know, AI search. So if you remember how bad it used to be for maybe even enterprise searches, it was just terrible. Now with AI search, you know, so Watson Discovery, that secret sauce for uh, winning on, on Jeopardy. You have the ability for Watson to ingest information, whether it's on your website or your backend enterprise system, and then allow you to do natural language searches on that. And so suddenly it can understand things semantically 
maybe even contextually he can return very good results, better than you could have ever imagined to achieve. That actually um, evolved to something else called a solution advisor. And what the solution advisor does is actually maybe calls uh, cross chat logs, things like that, backend systems. And what it would do is it would understand why you probably came. You know, for example, if you're in a call center, why you're likely calling and what you should do. So it, it does this by extracting ideal solutions and information from the back end. Uh, the next thing is virtual assistants. And so we see a lot of customers asking for these virtual assistants now. And so what typically happens in a call center, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a call center, but you may have a, an agent that's chatting with a customer. And then instead of them looking for information themselves, they just ask Watson. And so again, Watson, you know, they may ask Watson, hey, is, does Trey have coverage to go to an urgent care provider, this specific urgent care provider? And Watson could actually return that back to him. It could also walk the agents through steps. You know, for example, if you're calling your cable provider and there may be some steps for resetting your, your internet or something else, you could actually walk the agent through that, and then the agent could be walking the customer through that. And, and where we, we're seeing this going, so, that, so virtual, a, virtual assistant is picking up. Where we're really seeing this going, there's a lot of interest. There's been two Fortune 50 companies I've spoken to in the past two weeks that are interested in things like uh, chat copilot and active listening copilot. In the chat copilot, you know, you may have someone who's doing a live chat. Watson can actually listen at the same time and then provide answers uh, to the agent proactively. And then the agent could actually maybe push a button and send that information to the customer. And the active listening co-pilot, and this is, this is for a call center, what, what you can actually do is have Watson listening actively, proactively to the call. And then, you know, based on what the, the customer is saying, actually bring up information on, on the uh, customer agent's console so they can actually respond. And, and so the nice thing about this is, you know, because IBM tries to keep their AI open is that it can be deployed anywhere. So it can be deployed in the IBM cloud. You know, so we, we have public cloud, we have private cloud. Uh, you can actually deploy it to any of the other um, large cloud vendors that you want to. And so what it does is it doesn't lock you in and it gives you the opportunity to integrate these Watson solutions that, that specifically focus on the conversational side with any other data and AI frameworks in any other platform that you want to do. And, and so just to kind of give you a background, I, I call this, I used to call it our IBM conversational agent trifecta, but there's really a fourth piece now. So in the past year and a half, we've suddenly provided the ability so that anybody can go out and attach this Watson AI to a phone system so that suddenly, in, in, in talking in terms of the public cloud, for six and a half cents a minute, you can have Watson AI actually fielding your phone calls and taking convers and having conversations with your customers. And, and so what we're gonna do first is we're gonna, I'm gonna have Adrian, talk about Watson Assistant, and then I'll come back and talk about uh, some of these other pieces. And I think what, uh, he's going to cover the Watson Assistant for voice interaction, this ability to connect Watson to your telephony system, and then, then I'll probably give a demo of that. So back to you, Adrian. Awesome. Thanks, Trey. Okay. Let me get my screen. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yes. Great. Okay. So like Trey said, right, IBM was one of the first to sort of start down this path of operationalizing AI. Um, and as it started doing that, um, seeing the opportunities that were there, it began looking for ways to use this in industry. And one of the things it noticed uh, specifically for our solution that we call Watson Assistant is that uh, in a lot of industries, um, there's places where we can automate interactions um, that take up a lot of time or are very repetitive that cost companies lots of money or uh, you know 
cause their employees to be overworked, spend too much time on something that's very simple, or leave the uh, customer very frustrated and not wanting to come back or not getting the answer that they want. Um, you know, most company or most customers, they only need a couple of bad interactions before they decide not to use a service anymore, not to come back. Uh, and they want in this age of, you know, quick responses, digital, online all the time, they want responses right now uh, when they need it and through whatever channel uh, they can get it. And so that's where Watson Assistant comes in and that's uh, our AI powered um, virtual assistant. Uh, it allows our customers to, you know, find answers to any questions they're having, get support, um, and then as you know, a company progresses with the technology, interact with more and more powerful virtual assistants that can uh, do more, starting with, like Trey said, an FAQ-based kind of virtual assistant, going up all the way to a uh, more integrated, uh, more powerful um, assistant that can handle very complex conversations, understand that natural language, and give you specific answers um, while tying into a company's backend system so that everything feels seamless like you are talking to an actual agent. Um, and we make this very easy for, the, uh, for companies and customers. Um, some of the ways that you know, our assistant uh, is, is better or great is uh, you don't need to be an actual coder to implement this, but some solutions there's a lot of um, you know, backend work. We have a very simple to use, easy to understand uh, UI that allows you to stand these up quickly. And really the, the goal there is to allow subject matter experts in the field, people working in call centers, right? People who are actually interacting with customers to set these up in ways that they know will interact the right way, um, that will you know, feel seamless, that will give the customers the answers that they're looking for within the industry that you know, they're in. Uh, we're, we're able to deploy this anywhere so where you're not locked into IBM, um, although we'd prefer that you'd be here, but you can deploy this on any cloud. Uh, we have one of the best NLUs, so uh, you know, we're not keyword matching here. We're actually understanding a sentence, parsing it, understanding the sentiments in it. What is the customer trying to say? What is their intent? Um, you know, what words are they using? How are they feeling? What is the, uh, the different semantics within their sentence? And that's actually uh, determining how the assistant is interacting with the customer and can change, you know, whether they, you know, decide to search for something uh, in a set of documents that the company has ingested or whether it says, you know, this uh, customer isn't getting the answer they want, they're starting to get frustrated. Let's go ahead and, and hand this off to an agent, which is something that we're able to do seamlessly uh, and we have you know, built-in connectors to do that to some of the biggest um, customer service providers. And you know, uh, this solution scales uh, very well, right? So you, on, you only have to build uh, one assistant, one um, you know, virtual assistant for what you're trying to do. And then you can scale that across any channel uh, and it can interact with customers um, all the time and around the clock and you're, you're not limited like you are with a human agent to you know, one customer per agent at a time. You know, so Watson can actually service multiple customers at any time, any channel around the clock. So this you know, scales really well, allows you to cover um, a lot of ground and ultimately saves lots of money and time. And so uh, you know, some of the differentiators, some of the features, um, we allow you to actually bring in agents, like I said, bring in experts. So we have connectors that allow you to connect to, you know, intercoms, Zendesk, Salesforce, uh, whatever you're using, we have those built in so that it's, it's really quick uh, and easy to set that up. Um, one thing I'll show a demo in a, in a minute, but you know, if a lot of agents you can interact uh, via web chat and those take time to set up, uh, they're not always easy to set up, but we have a built in solution that you can stand up in minutes um, that works really well and creates a really nice experience for the customer. I saw somebody uh, ask in the chat, um, how is it possible to, or how, to, how they handle where there aren't many text um, examples. So in general, you know, in order to start uh, developing an assistant 
um, figuring out you know, how you want that dialogue to work, you typically don't need too many examples. Of roughly five to 10 examples of how people are going to ask questions is enough for the uh, assistant to start leveraging its AI capabilities and um, identifying any other you know, version of what that question will be, and then I correctly identify it to address the customer need. But if you do have text examples um, or chat logs, anything, you know, CSV files of how people are actually interacting with your current system, we make it possible for you to actually ingest, upload those logs, and uh, Assistant Watson will actually go and use that to create relevant um, examples for, uh, for the chatbot. And then that will make it, you know, even better, you know, fitted for uh, your industry for those actual customer interactions. Um, and that allows, you know, the customer to quickly get up and running, uh, makes it very easy. They don't have to sit there and think, oh, how exactly do customers interact? Like they can just use what they already have to get a very well fitted, um, you know, product. We also have disambiguation built into us, uh, Watson Assistant. So a lot of times, right, we're, we've mentioned that you know, it's not a keyword match. Um, it's actually understanding what the user is saying, uh, parsing that for you know, semantics, uh, emotions, et cetera. Uh, another thing that this allows us to do is actually understand you know, what they're saying. And if, and if we can't answer it, we actually have the ability to ask them questions back. Uh, and and figure out what did you mean? Did you mean this or that? And actually, you know, you know, not necessarily. It leads to less. Oh, I don't know how to answer that, or I couldn't find an answer to that. And it actually creates a more human experience that gets to what the customer is looking for and leaves them much more satisfied. Uh, then you know, a lot of us have experience with uh, some chatbots where you ask a question that's very simple and it says, Oh, I don't know. Uh, because it, it doesn't actually know what you're asking. It's just looking for some match. Um, this helps us do that and get around any issues. And then we also provide analytics of how the customer is using uh, the virtual assistant. So you can actually track um, how many messages, uh, you know, how many interactions there are, what people are actually asking. You can see those conversations. Um, you can, you know, uh, dive into uh, specific interactions that maybe didn't lead to a resolution, led to a call drop, led to an agent transfer. You can actually look at what was said and figure out if there was, uh, if there's some wording, if there was something where the assistant wasn't picking up what you wanted. And then you can actually use that information, those analytics to uh, improve your um, interactions, improve your assistant over time. And uh, you know, Trey later is going to talk about discovery, but what, uh, we also have the ability to integrate uh, with Watson discovery. So not only can you answer more short tail questions, um, questions that, are, that come up very often, right? Especially in a call center, a lot of questions that come in are very repetitive, they're very simple, and the answers are out there, but maybe they're just hard to find. So a lot of assistants address those kind of questions and help automate those interactions, which saves a lot of time and money. But there are plenty of uh, people who call in, plenty of questions that customers can have that they need answers to that maybe aren't as simple to answer. And in that case, we have the ability to easily uh, tie into our discovery service. And you can then, if the assistant notices that they've asked the question, it's parsed that language, determine they're asking something that isn't quite as simple, it can actually go and uh, send an API call to discovery and pull the most relevant uh, content back that it determines is uh, relevant to what the customer is asking. And we make that very simple to do uh, and easy to set up. And so, you know, right now, uh, I want to go ahead and show um, a quick demo of assistant. So as I'm sure you are familiar with, we have this COVID-19 situation going on right now. Uh, and one thing that IBM has been able to set up um, that's been you know, really well received and shows the power of Watson Assistant is an assistant specifically for that. Um, but it just shows you know, what Watson Assistant is able to do. So for instance, you can see we mentioned it's, uh, you can interact via text, email, web chat. Um, we've set up a simple web chat here. 
uh, and I'm actually able to interact with it and ask something like, how can I tell if I have coronavirus? And like I've mentioned, it's not actually, you know, giving me a keyword match. It's not saying, oh, it's a coronavirus. So I'm going to give this exact answer. It's actually noticing that um, it's actually parsing that question. And then it's taking me through a series of, of questions to learn more about what it is uh, I want to know about. So in this case, you know, how can I tell if I have coronavirus? It's actually going to take me through a CDC triage um, that will help determine on the fly if I do or don't have uh, coronavirus. So you know, it's going to ask me back, well, do you have a fever? Um, and I could ask, uh, what is considered a fever? And so this is actually an example of uh, what we call a digression. So you'll notice a lot of times when we have human to human interaction, uh, the conversations aren't always linear. Um, things don't always work as I ask a question, you give me an answer, I ask a question, you give me an answer. We've actually made it possible for Watson to have that same interaction. Um, so in this case, it's asking if I have a fever. I could ask what's considered a fever. That's not an answer to that question, but it's actually going to parse that, understand what I'm asking, be able to digress out of this conversation and give me an actual answer. Right, so it's going to tell me that a person has a fever is above, you know, 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, and then it's going to actually come back to the original conversation without having lost its place, uh, the same way that a human would. So we're providing a very natural human experience, um, even though this is a, you know, an assistant, a virtual assistant. So I could say, yes, I have a fever, um, and I'll say, do you have shortness of breath? No, I do not. And then it can give me, you know, an answer uh, back telling me, you know, you probably don't have coronavirus, but you may have other symptoms for the flu. And then it'll follow up and actually provide more information that the customer uh, can use and look at. For instance, you know, I could say, okay, well, tell me more about the flu and the coronavirus. And, you know, in, in the spirit of providing very rich experience, we're actually able to not just do, you know, text back and forth, but pull in different multimedia um, sources, right? So here we're providing an image that's actually being stored in a, in a database. Uh, and, you know, another thing to, to point out is you know, we got here through these, uh, you know, I got here by clicking on this link, but I, do, I don't have to actually click on that link to get to this answer, right? Again, this isn't going down a decision tree. I could say, you know, how does the flu differ from coronavirus. I think I misspelled it, but you can actually get to this answer in multiple ways, right? So it's a very fluid system. Uh, it's not just going down a decision tree, one predefined path. Uh, we also, you know, like I mentioned, have the ability to integrate with our Watson discovery service. So we have the ability to crawl websites, uh, ingest documents from um, many different SharePoints um, that uh, there are. So I could say, is there a test kit for coronavirus? And what it's doing now is it's recognizing what I was saying earlier, that this isn't quite an easy question to answer. It's actually going to the CDC website, which this uh, assistant is crawling and giving me back the most relevant links. And I could actually click on that and it'll take me to that actual uh, um, site, that actual link on the website, um, which makes it very easy for customers to get what they're looking for quickly that they may not be able to find right away or um, by going onto that website. And then, you know, finally, another, I've mentioned disambiguation, that's our ability to not only parse uh, the natural language, understand what it's saying, um, and then you know ask questions, have a back and forth to really narrow down what the customer is asking for, instead of saying, oh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, another sort of feature that we have that provides this very human experience is something uh, we call slots. So we have the ability to capture certain information or ask for it so that the customer doesn't get, you know, oh, I don't know the answer to that because I don't have this information. So if someone were to ask, you know, can my kids go back to school? 
It's a very open-ended question. There's a couple things that you know a human would need to know in order to answer that. So that's exactly what Watson is going to do as well, right? Leveraging that AI, being able to create that human experience. It's going to ask, what type of school do your children attend? I could say college. And you know, I'm in Austin. So it'll actually tell me that colleges and universities in this zip code have moved their classes online. Uh, but you see, if I ask, uh, you know, when can my high school student go back to school? You'll see that it, it's already, because I've already provided that information on my zip code, it's already taken that into account. So it's not asking for that again. Whereas if I had asked this question the first time, it would have needed that information. It would have asked for it. So it, it's able to actually retain information uh, within the context of a conversation um, and then answer, uh, you know, ask for the questions that it needs answers to and then provide that response. So it creates a very you know, fluid and human experience. Um, so that's what I wanted to show for Watson Assistant. You've kind of seen our ability to quickly stand up uh, something that crawls websites, um, is able to ingest documents, provide that to the user, is able to uh, parse you know, what the human is saying, what the user is saying, and actually give a very natural back and forth. Um, and so wrapping it up, what I want to show are just some examples of uh, what we've been able to do or what other people have done. So in, order, in terms of getting started right, with Assistant, there are you know, three main ways. Uh, Trey alluded to this earlier when he was speaking in the beginning. But we see a lot of people starting out with AI and specifically with Assistant and virtual assistants. Um, in call centers or, or in any interaction where there are uh, customers asking questions, needing some sort of resolution to a problem. Um, and we make it really easy. And there are a couple of ways to get started with automating that process. And it really comes down to, you know, where the virtual assistant is facing. So the, the first way is um, to provide an assistant facing your customers that makes it easier for them to get those answers. Uh, and this is what's known as customer self-service. Um, so we provide those text-based, voice-based um, channels for them to get answers to the question, kind of like what we just saw in uh, a demo. This makes it, uh, this allows you to deflect calls, right? Which, you know, saves companies money. Um, it takes a load of work off of your uh, agents in a call center, um, which means they're not going to be spending so much time on repetitive questions. They're gonna have more time to focus on uh, you know, things that come up that need more of their attention that aren't quite as easy to answer. And that's going to make their experience better overall and reduce turnover, save the company money in that way. Uh, we also can have this facing your employees. So a lot of companies have, you know, internal portals, places where uh, employees can go to get information about benefits, um, salaries, uh, etc. Uh, this is a great way to get started um, by facing this chatbot to them so that they can get the answers uh, to those questions. We have the ability to integrate with, you know, uh, your backend system so that these uh, virtual assistants can, you know, go from simple answers to uh, more involved understanding who is interacting with it, understanding their, their company profile uh, and giving them specific answers to what they're asking that are contextual um, and very relevant to them. And then we also have Watson Assistant for uh, Agent Assist, which is in call centers, um, having your uh, virtual assistant aiding your agent so that as they are taking on more complex questions, they can actually use the assistant to uh, find out the information in their corpus of documents um, that they've ingested that the customer is asking about. Maybe they don't know the answer. Um, they can then use Watson Assistant and Discovery to actually get those answers quickly, um, much faster than they would by themselves. Uh, and that you know, helps speed up their interactions, resolve uh, customer questions much faster, um, and takes a load off of their shoulders. So uh, you know, in 
the public sector, you know, we see this a lot with um, governments, counties, uh, actually using this to serve their citizens better, um, turning this kind of like what we just saw towards the citizens, towards their own employees, um, making it easier to uh, handle cases, um, interact with customers who have questions about, you know, their utilities. For example, you know, Miami-Dade County actually uh, used this and created a virtual agent called AVA, um, which is interacting with their customers or uh, with their citizens, giving them information about you know, their, uh, their utilities, uh, answering questions about their bills, payments. Um, and, uh, you know, we've also seen this in Maricopa County, you know, they have uh, used this to actually improve um, their ability to find uh, documents um, for their, you know, their justice system, so that they're able to share court information, retrieve court information that's been documented much faster uh, than if it was all located in one location in some binder on a shelf that they now have to go and find. Um, so these are ways, you know, in, in the public sphere that it's being used to actually improve services um, and save money both through, you know, call centers, but also um, just speeding up the time to answers and providing better service. And then uh, Trey mentioned this, but we also, we're not only just uh, web chat based, um, text-based, but we have the ability to integrate uh, with telephony systems through our, our Wavy service, which is Watson Assistant and Voice Interaction. Um, so this means you're actually able to take the same interactions that we saw in that demo that we've been talking about and do these over the phone. Uh, so you're able to parse natural language in real time using our assistant speech-to-text, text-to-speech, and language translation services. Um, and actually integrate with a telephony system and, and provide your customer the ability to actually talk and speak. And, and it's then able to actually pick up on what they're saying and naturally answer questions and hand off to an agent if needed. But this is a great way to provide, you know, phase out an IVR uh, and provide a, a much better service that's actually listening to what the customer is saying. And then this is the architecture you know, for that service, right? So we have our services, they're being tied together through Wavy, connecting with uh, existing telephony networks and then communicating with the customer. And so that's kind of a short overview of Watson Assistant going into some use cases, showing you how it works in real time. Uh, and, you know, another use case is our ability to integrate with discovery, right? So you can, we've mentioned this, but you can not just answer simple questions, but get more in depth. Uh, but I'm going to hand it back to you, Trent, to discuss more on that and discovery uh, overall. Okay. Thanks, Adrian. So I, I know we're almost running out of time, so uh, I'll just go through this stuff real quickly. Let me share my screen. While you're pulling that up, Trey, there was one question uh, for, for both you guys around how long was uh, a, a typical startup implementation to get Watson Assistant working? And so I actually answered that. It, you know, it can take from days to weeks. We had some customers where we were implementing this COVID-19 solution. You know, we would have them up within 24 to 48 hours. On, the, on these typical implementations, you know, we see people take weeks. We've done more complex integration in call centers that maybe take a few more months, but you know, usually it's an iter iterative process anyway. So you kind of want to look and say, what, what's my low hand fruit, what I want to solve, and then continuously evolve the solutions. Great, thanks. Any other questions? None that I'm seeing right now. So somebody asked about the SMS being an asynchronous solution. Are you saying this is available now? Uh, yes, you can actually, this, this same Watson assistant for voice interaction that you can actually hook up to your phone system, you can actually have it send text messages too. So I know I only have about seven minutes left. Uh, I'll just show you some quick slides and then I, I'll show you how simple it really is to implement this stuff. So when we're talking about Watson Discovery, you know, I said this is the secret sauce that helped us win on Jeopardy. 
And what it really does is, is it provides an AI insight engine. And so it, it gives you multiple things. It gives you the ability to connect to your backend repository, your enterprise systems. It has something called smart document understanding that I'm going to show you quickly. And what that actually does is it uses artificial intelligence, computer vision to look at a document and understand the format. And then you can actually annotate the fields in the document. And then whenever once it's used again, it'll actually know exactly which field you're talking about, what it means. And then you can actually have Watson do question answers. So a lot of times I'll have customers that want to do FAQ type questions. And, and so what they can actually do is they can put it in a Word document or a PDF, ingest it into Watson, annotate what is the question and what is the answer. And then without any training, I can connect it to Watson Assistant and be able to answer that question you know, when, when people ask it. And the nice thing is that it, it is actually a little bit intelligent. So it understands that, you know, it may be explicitly written this way in the document, but it's able to extrapolate and recognize maybe there's different ways you can say this. Someone can say it a little bit different. It can actually understand it and answer it the same way. Uh, so it can do things like answer retrieval, uh, so it can do question answers to basically two types of AI search, question answer and a passage retrieval. So when you combine it with the smart document, document understanding, you can do question answer. And generally it, it does passage retrieval, where if you do a Google search, you'll see a lot of times on the right, the top right, it may give you like a card with some information. That's the same thing. And the other thing we let you do is that you know, so Watson Discovery can crawl your website, crawl your backend systems, and we can actually take something called Watson Now Studio in the far right corner, train it to understand the language of your business, your terminology, maybe even your slang, and then it can actually you can actually do natural language searches on this backend data, and Watson will understand and be able to bring back the correct answer if you're doing question and answer or the correct passages if you're doing the passage search. And so, uh, again, with the smart document understanding, to me, this is this is a major advancement where suddenly AI can look at the format of a document and then start an understanding contextually what it means. Uh, we support a lot of connectivity for crawling your back end enterprise systems, and we support a lot of languages natively. And so when I say uh, we support language, we're not just you know, doing translation, we actually natively understand it. We understand all the idioms. So you can actually have that smooth, true uh, native language experience. So I mentioned Watson Now Studio. I'm about to show these to you in a minute. So why do you have to train Watson? So Watson understands a lot of things in the world. So we give it a lot of data, data sources like Wikipedia and things like that. But in reality, you know, if you are in the legal profession or medical profession, you know, some other profession with a lot of terminology, then this gives you the ability to train Watson with terminology that doesn't come out of the box. And so what it does is it can even take abstract concepts. In this case, we did this for the National uh, Highway Transportation Board where they were having, you know, these millions of accident reports every year. And they, they weren't really able to do any correlation on, you know, is, is there a problem with tires or the car, you know, if you think back to 2000, 2001, where there was a problem with the Port Explorer and the Bridgestone tires, you know, they really couldn't capture that because it was taking them too long to uh, crawl through this data. So with something like Watson Knowledge Studio combined with Discovery, it can actually, you can actually train it to understand even concept, uh, sorry, abstract concepts like, you know, certified advanced 208 compliant airbag system is a part of a car. You know, and, and you give it some examples in it, you teach it that, and then you can start giving it lots of other reports, and it can pull out, you know, uh, model year, manufacturer, things like that. So it's pretty powerful. And, and the other thing that makes me excited is, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that Watson went in on Jeopardy was an open computer science problem. You know, the ability to have a computer that could answer questions like a human was a big challenge for decades. And last year, uh, IBM introduced something called Project Debater. And, and so if you look at Watson on Jeopardy, suddenly this is going to be IBM providing that same, you know, 
uh, Jeopardy experience in your enterprise. And so what's going to happen is that, you know, before, you know, we currently do like passage retrieval or we do question and answers to do that smart document understanding. What you're going to have is you're going to have the ability to ingest a bunch of documents, for example, Wikipedia. And then after you've ingested Wikipedia into your instance of Watson, you can ask it, who is the 16th president? You need to be able to say Abraham Lincoln. And so this is going to change everything. And, and I, I know I only got one minute. Um, so I guess I can stop here. I was going to show you how simple it was to do these things, but um, and I, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Great. Thanks, Trey. Uh, there, and uh, appreciate you guys uh, taking us through that overview and uh, sharing in uh, a lot of great advances in the, the Watson AI capabilities. There, there are two questions to, uh, to wrap up uh, this session here. Uh, first one is, how do you approach when you have several templates uh, for the chat conversation, such as orders, invoices, et cetera? For Watson Assistant? Yes. All right, let me sh show you real quickly what I have done with Watson Assistant. If I can find that, uh, where I put that. You know, so to give you an example for something like that, where it could be kind of complex. So what I did it at Auburn University this semester with my students is that I made them create an instance of Watson where you could call it up and you could order anything on the Domino's pizza menu. If you look at Domino's, they'll tell you there's 20, 29 million different combinations of pizzas you can order without even, uh, you know, do anything special like extra cheese or extra pepperoni. When you add the rest of the menu items, it's over 500 million. Uh, so it's hundreds of millions of different possibilities. And then almost all the menu items are made of the same thing. So what you can actually do, and this is where Watson Assistant goes a step beyond, you give it an example. So this is how you train it. So remember I mentioned that these artificial neural networks work on uh, you know, recognizing patterns. I give it patterns. But the thing I can also do is I can annotate these patterns. And so what this does is it builds two levels of machine learning models that can understand things in context. So it could, even if there's a lot of subtlety, it can actually understand this. I hope that answered the question. I, and I guess I'll add one more thing. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Trent. I was going to say that there's also a buff. There's for, to give you an example of the, of the complexity, there's also, you know, there's buffalo chicken bites, there's uh, buffalo chicken wings, and then there's a the buffalo chicken pizza. So what I, what I was able to do with the students is we, we give Watson, you know, samples like this, and I tell it, you know, this buffalo chicken bites, that's actually, uh, it, it's complaints because they're already annotated, but I tell it that, you know, this is the chicken, and so it won't confuse it with the pizza or the wings. Okay, uh, there's one more question and we'll wrap this up. Does the Watson virtual assistant um, come with domain specific knowledge? So we actually have a catalog with some content to kind of get you started. And then, then we have things called cartridges that maybe are built specifically for the legal field or the medical field. Uh, so other than that, you know, you have to build it yourself. Great, thanks. Well, that takes us to the end of the hour, everyone. Uh, I want to thank Trey and Adrian so much for, for the content and conversation. And if you do have any other questions, uh, don't worry, Tech D will be following up with you. Um, we'll be providing the slides as well as a recording of this. And uh, we're happy to continue to answer your questions uh, and invite you to uh, learn more about Watson uh, with Tech D and our, our friends at IBM. We're happy to show you more custom demo, uh, some more of the advanced capabilities we weren't able to get to today, as well as, uh, you know, further extensions to the platform. So thank you again for your time. We really appreciate everyone attending.
Hope you have a great day. Stay safe and be well. Thanks. Thank you.